stand by says break. break. Yeah. yeah. It's on my camera right now. You say, if it's recording, you say action. Action. Okay. Can so, I have like this? Yeah, no, just, okay. just action. <laughs> no, that's called cut, cut. Cut, <laughs> okay. Cut. Okay, so, uh, benefits. Section two, I'm repeating now. So, the first part was overall introduction, so the, an introduction to capital markets. Now comes attractions. Attractions of the global capital market. So why is the global capital market so attractive? Well, number one is very simple. Increasing supply of funds. Increasing supply of funds. Now we can borrow from London and Frankfurt and Paris or New York or Tokyo, Hong Kong or Singapore. So you increase significantly the supply of funds. Here funds has pretty much the same meaning of what I explained before as capital. So that's the first major attraction why people like it. The second one is a wider range of investment opportunities. So better or more investment opportunities. Now we in Bulgaria again can invest in Germany or London or the US or now in many countries around the world. You can invest in stocks, we can invest in bonds, we can invest in bonds in Greece, but we don't like or invest in stocks in Italy or Germany or France or whatever other country. So it increases the investment opportunities and the various types of investments. Okay, let's see. So, another major attraction, especially for the borrower, is increased market liquidity. So, Liquidity is the ability to sell debt or the ability to raise capital without affecting the price. So you can now easily borrow two billion on the capital markets and not increase the interest rate or 10 billion and not increase the interest rate. So liquidity is the ability or the availability of capital at a particular price, okay? That's sometimes they also call it depth, but I don't want to get into the depth of a market. So overall liquidity means you have a better availability of capital. Let's see what else we got associated with market liquidity and with increasing supply of capital is reduced borrowing cost. Reduced borrowing cost. For example, it's a whole lot cheaper for the Greeks, or oh sorry, for the Greek government to borrow from Germany and German banks than to borrow from Bulgarian or Greek <coughs> banks, okay? So, 
borrowers, whether it's IBM or General Electric or BMW or Mercedes, they can borrow cheaper on London and Tokyo, maybe then in their own Frankfurt market, okay? If they need to borrow 10 billion or 20 billion or uh, uh, talking about large amounts of capital. So reduced borrowing cost. Now, borrowing cost in finance is a very, very special name and a special word which is in every single textbook everywhere. It's called cost of capital. Where capital, again, means debt and equity. So, global capital markets are attractive because the increased supply of capital effectively reduces the cost of capital. So, increased supply results in lower cost of capital. So, businesses love it. Lower cost of capital means businesses pay less to their investors, to their creditors. Okay? They don't have to pay as much. So businesses, governments, borrowers in general have a lower cost of capital. Let's see. Lower cost of capital. Okay. For investors, so these were mostly for uh, borrowers here, investment opportunities are for investors. Now, let's get a little more about investors. We call, let's write it in red. It's not in the book. It's interesting. They don't have the term. I mean, they explain in a whole paragraph how investors diversify their portfolios <laughs> internationally or globally. We call this international diversification. International diversification. First of all, diversification means reducing the risk of investment portfolio because or due to increasing number of assets. If you have investing in gold, you're going to have high variability and high risk. When you invest gold and, let's say, bonds, the overall volatility, which measures the risk, falls. When you include gold, oil, a bond, and a stock, volatility will fall further. So as you increase the number of stocks and the number of bonds and the number of commodities and possibly the number of asset classes, like the number of currencies and real estate, as you increase the overall risk of the portfolio falls. This reduction in risk is called diversification. So as you invest, for example, in more and more and more stocks <coughs> in the United States, uh, if this is here N, number of stocks, camera, camera, oh, you're taking a little nap, and here is risk, if you have one stock, one stock and equal one, you're going to have a very high risk. Well, if you have two stocks, risk will fall. Three stocks will fall. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And as you get to increase to 20 or 30, the risk will be going down very, very, very little, okay? This risk over here from, let's say, here, to here is called diversifiable risk and this is non-diversifiable risk. 
you can increase the number of stocks to 30, to 40, to 50, to 100, to 1,000, to 10,000, you're not going to reduce this risk. Well, that's if you invest in the US market or if you invest in the British market. But if you invest in the US market and the British market and maybe the Japanese market and the Chinese market and so on, the German, the French market, in other words, if this, if you do what's called international diversification, the, the rate of diversification will be a little bit higher. And the overall risk, meaning non-diversifiable risk, also called systematic risk, is going to be a little less. So if you got to invest only in 20 stocks, you will get lower risk by spreading these stocks from as many different countries as possible. Maybe take one French, one German, one British, one Chinese, one Japanese, one Korean, and so on. So, international diversification results in better diversification and for investors lower risk better diversification and lower risk so for a German, it makes sense to buy also some British stocks and some French stocks and maybe even Greek stocks, Bulgarian, Japanese, and so on. Okay. Diversified portfolio. Okay, let's write it out. It's in the book. It's called Systematic Risk. Systematic risk is the risk that cannot be reduced with diversification. It's the risk which is left or remained after all diversification is used. So, international diversification lowers systematic and overall risk. It is also known, they have it in the textbook, as non, it's the same non-diversifiable. A tremendous benefit for global investors. Okay, so simple question is why? Why, as you introduce more countries, you get better diversification? And the answer is correlation, low correlation. France has a relatively different macroeconomic policy from Germany, and Britain has a different macroeconomic policy from Germany. And sure, Japan and India and China have a very different macroeconomic policy. So, risk to a great degree is also driven by macroeconomic policy, by the structure of the economy. And the correlation of stocks between different countries is not very high. So as you increase the number of countries, the correlation between them is not perfect. And as you add more and more, it's called uncorrelated resources or uncorrelated assets or investments, the overall diversification increases and the risk goes down. So the major reason the international diversification works is that markets between different countries are not highly correlated. You can have the Indian market go up and the German market go down, or the Indian market go down and the German market go up. You may have the British market go up and the French market go down. So you don't have very, very high correlation. Now, it is true that what globalization has done is increase the overall interconnectedness between markets is increased overall correlation between markets 
and as a result has reduced the overall benefit and effect of international diversification is a little lower over time because the Bulgarian market now moves together with the German market and moves together with the Greek market. So Bulgarian market, Greek market, and German market are now <coughs> relatively closely correlated, which wasn't true 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. Okay, so time with globalization, this effect disappears or let's call it dissipate slowly but it is still there okay and the second reason so the first reason is different macro policies but there is a separate reason completely different reason is called capital controls And capital controls involve restriction of moving capital from one country to another and or restriction in acquiring foreign capital. So it's a restriction if you want to buy Chinese stocks, you can't easily buy Chinese stocks. The Chinese government does not allow foreign ownership. What does it say there in the first one? Macro? Macro policies. Macro policy. Oh. So a different macro policy means that stocks will not be performing the same. Stocks in China will be totally different from Japan, will be totally different from India, will be totally different from Germany. Because of totally different macro policy. Now I've got a huge inflation in India and one set of problems with one set of policy and a totally different set of problems in Germany and a completely different set of problems in, in Greece. So different problems will result in different policies which in turn will result in different performance of stock markets. So stock markets will be relatively little correlated. And stock markets will be also little correlated because they have different types of capital controls between countries. Russia will have one type of capital controls. Different countries will have different. All right, let's see what else we got. The perception, 10 year, okay, the creation, emergence, okay, we got this one. And Another type of risk I haven't covered, it's a completely different story, which you need to understand. It's a whole separate chapter, which I will uh, not cover. It's called floating exchange rates. Floating exchange rate pose a risk that the currency you've invested in goes down, but also pose with any risk, they also have a benefit. And the benefit is that if you've invested in two currency and the one currency goes down, there is a good chance that the other currency will go up and offset the risk from the first. So. Just because you have exchange rates and have an exchange rate risk, exchange rate risk may translate into loss, but exchange rate risk may translate into a benefit, and exchange rate risk may actually result in currency diversification. Investors put in, I'm just throwing, I'm making these numbers up, 25% in Euro and Euro bonds, 25% in Japanese yen, 25% in US dollars, and 25% in Swiss francs, okay? And that's a fairly good currency diversification. So, it is true that floating exchange rates provide or increase risk, but with proper di diversification, the exact opposite can be true. Diversification 
especially, especially we call now currency diversification, can lower currency risk. So risk goes both ways. You can increase it or you can decrease it, okay? It depends on the circumstances. All right. And now section number three. The growth of global financial market. Uh, capital, global. Yeah, we got a lot of people now talking, talking, talking over there. All right. So we, we got about, what, 15 minutes, right? 20 minutes. Let's try 15, 20 minutes for you to concentrate, OK? So growth of financial markets is based on, first of all, capital markets are, it's very simple and very easy and everybody understands it. It's called, they are information intensive. Information intensive industry or information intensive business. And the explosion of the global capital markets is caused by increase in the same stuff that we discussed in chapter one in globalization. Increase in data processing, So the reason behind the explosive growth is the rapid rise of data processing, the rapid rise of communication technology. Of course, with these two, it is part of these two is the internet. the rise of databases, and again, all of these mean skyrocketing computing power. Again, these are all mean increased computing power. I mean, back 30 years ago, we have huge mainframes, and a mainframe will be bigger than the size of this room. And that mainframe will have a capability significantly lower than the computing capability of just an ordinary iPhone or an ordinary modern smartphone, like a Galaxy, okay? So, extraordinary rise of computing power has driven the capital markets and, of course, communication and integrate, uh, and Internet. Uh, this has resulted in term in what's called the integrated, integrated integrated capital market. Integrated basically means that they are all tightly linked. Whatever happens in New York within a tenth of a second will be transmitted and already known and reflected in prices in London and in prices in Tokyo. So, capital markets today are tightly integrated or tightly coupled, which is part of what I've discussed before, the interdependency. So, the markets are highly interdependent and interdependent capital markets make for interdependent economy. And you can easily have one capital market of a country crash, and then it will result in the wave of crashes, the domino effect, which I discussed before, or the same as the contagion uh, effect. Okay. So that's the one piece. And the other piece we already discussed before is 
deregulation. Well, it is fairly obvious, it's well known, that deregulation attracts capital. It was only a matter of time before someone would decide to deregulate their market, gain competitive advantage over other countries, and then other countries would respond by deregulating their own capital markets. Basically, if you don't deregulate your capital market, you are left behind and out of the competition. You have no choice. If you want to be a player, you have to deregulate your market. So there has been a wave of deregulation amongst many governments around the world. OK. And part of the deregulation involved, as I was explaining, capital controls. And capital controls are restrictions on acquiring foreign assets like foreign deposits, foreign stocks, foreign bonds, foreign businesses. Okay? It was also driven by the rise of free market ideology, which you watched on one of those videos that we discussed. The trend began in the 70s, 1970s in U.S., where the U.S. began to relax its own regulations because the U.S. market was becoming progressively uh, unregulated. And later on is known, let's write it out, in Britain, that's the big thing. It's called the Big Bang, which is 1986. It's not a movie. Big Bang is the sudden, quick removal of capital controls, restrictions, and regulations on the UK, on the British financial market. UK and the resulting Big Bang, or the resulting explosion, or at least the expected explosion of transactions and business as a result of this reduction. So, Britain became a leader in the world in 1986, totally slashing and smashing all of these uh, regulations and opening free markets, capital markets in London, in the so-called London City, or the City of London, okay? so. Since then, many other countries have followed. Whether they want it or not, they had to follow if they wanted to compete. Yeah, they have this here. I haven't heard it before. It's called the Little Bang. And the Little Bang, that's uh, page 419. is the similar reduction of regulations in France. So, Big Bang is the UK. France was scared to get left. Well, it was getting left behind. And they said, oh, we got to do something. We're going to make our own little reductions. And they did. And let's see what else. So deregulation, as I was explaining in chapter one, or chapter, uh, yeah, chapter one, maybe in the second lecture, has been a steady trend from the 1970s all the way to 2008. In 2008, the global financial crisis prompted many governments to rethink their free market ideology, free financial services ideology, and many governments began to impose new restrictions and new regulations on the financial markets. So there is a chance that 2008 might be the peak of global capital markets, 
might be the peak of their integration, and there is a good chance that they will be less integrated in coming years and possibly in the coming decades. So, we know that they've been more and more integrated in couple up until 2008, but it appears now to be more regulations, more restrictions, more capital controls, and this trend, which has been true for about 40 years, may no longer be true. I say may because three or four years of observation is not enough to make a good, solid conclusion. But at this point, we can make a good guess that there will be a reversal of this particular trend, or the trend will at least slow down, not be as big. Okay? And let's see what else we got. Okay, well, this is good enough. And let's see how much we got. We got a little section. Where is that? Over here. So, section three, page 420, global capital market risks. So, section two was benefits. Section three, Section three risks and We'll finish today with the risks. Isn't this section four? Well, okay, first of all, page 420. Benefits was one, two, three, and one. Page 420. Section one was introduction. Section one is introduction. Section two is benefits. Section three is risks. Now, the benefits section has, number one, overall working of a capital market. Number two, attractions of a capital market. And section three, growth, growth of a capital market. This is subsection three. Now we're into section three, global risks. Okay. Well. One of the key characteristics is that with the interconnectedness of global financial markets and global capital markets, markets have become more vulnerable. Is it a collapse in the banking system of Greece will result in a collapse of the banking system in Germany, okay. Bankruptcy of Spain will result the bankruptcy of the German, Italian, and French banking systems jointly. So, the whole system is becoming very vulnerable, significantly more vulnerable. Uh, globalization means that you get more destabilizing destabilizing effects resulting from, let's say, contagion. So contagion makes countries more vulnerable. Contagion makes overall financial markets have stronger destabilizing effects. Can you write Contagion, again, I'll write it for you. Okay. And part of the problem, or is the growth of so-called, a new term I'm introducing, 
it is well known as hot money. And hot money is better said to be speculative capital. Speculative capital means that it is a capital which is a in which is in search of quick returns. So it is quick it is short term it is profit oriented it comes quickly and it leaves quickly and is scared very quickly. Okay? So speculative capital they see some opportunity, they go, they jump, and after three days or three weeks or three months, they're out. When they think the opportunity is gone or they've profited most of it, they're already out. So they see some opportunity, for example, in Japan, Fukushima uh, is a big disaster, uh, okay? Major catastrophe going on, markets crash, speculative capital moves in, it buys, the stock market goes up for two or three days, they're out, and the stock market crashes again, okay? So that's all speculative capital. Speculative capital, similar thing happened in Bulgaria. Our stock market was going up, up, and up. It attracted a lot of Germans and Austrians and French and all sorts of international funds. They all opened money. They all started investing. Our market was going even higher. And when the party stopped, Suddenly they all sold and our market just crashed completely and died. Okay? Mm -hmm. And they say, blame the Germans. It's the Germans' fault. Okay? And then everybody's saying, no, no, no. We cannot let them profit from our misery. We must freeze the German capital and prevent them from selling and prevent them to withdrawing from our capital. What does it mean? It says, oh, we don't want them to sell and drive the price lower. We want them to stay, you know, to buy. We will sell and we will profit at the expense of the Germans. In other words, what the Bulgarians want to do is change the rules of the game midway through the game to hurt the foreigner at their own local Okay, so these are tricks and they say, oh, it is speculative capital, okay? They blame foreign speculative capital for that. And a lot of countries will do exactly that. While the capital is coming in, they say, welcome, welcome, we love your money. And then when the time comes and when you want to take your money out, they say, you cannot do that, okay? They impose capital controls on you and they lock your capital in whether you like it or don't like it. So part of the contagion problem is the existence of a lot of speculative capital, of the so-called rise of speculative capital. And the institution behind speculative capital, besides all commercial banks and all the other things, the institution is called a hedge fund, which are unregulated funds that can invest in whatever they want, whenever they want, however they want, borrowing as much as they please, and bearing all sorts of risks, and they can invest for minutes, or hours, or days, or weeks. So these are the guys who are running now trillions of dollars of hot money, meaning speculative capital, and they are behind this. And part of modern day financial instability is the rise of the relative share of hot money 
relative to what they call patient money. Let's write it. Yeah, that's not a good term. Patient money. Patient money is capital which is invested for long-term profit and long-term growth. And investors would invest for two, maybe five, maybe 10, maybe 15 years with an expectation of long-term development and growth. And the problem is that while 40, 50 years ago, patient or long-term capital was 90% and speculative capital was barely 5 or 10%. Today, the largest form of capital, 70 to 80% in the world is basically now has turned itself into a speculative capital and there is very little patient money. Patient money is what we call investment capital. Investment. Same as long-term capital. In a very different way of saying it, there's been a huge rise in the amount of short-term capital, and there's been a major decline in a long-term capital. Fun, right? Man. Let's see what else we have. Uh, another problem is, you just go out, have your fun, enjoy, get a drink, get a coffee. Uh, another thing is, quality of, information. Uh, many people don't trust, and of course should not under any circumstances, trust financial information coming out of China. More and more and more scandals are coming up every day, and these scandals basically point out that you can't <coughs> trust the Chinese for their data. They will fudge the data, they will lie on the data, they'll do whatever they have to do. So the quality of information is poor in many countries. A lot of investors learned the hard way that in many Arab countries, information is unreliable and you can't trust their information. In other words, it is a very poor quality of information. And there is also what's called information gap. Many of those people are not educated and sophisticated in advanced accounting techniques. They don't understand it. They don't understand uh, international rules. They don't understand international accounting. They're trying to make the accounting serve their personal purposes, their goals, as opposed to the investors. There is no regulatory body above that. So all of these quality of information is a significant risk in global financial markets. And I've already discussed, uh, will not discuss a lot more. Currency risks. These are always present as long as you invest in a foreign currency. The foreign currency can go up or it can go down. You don't know, you can't tell. It's a risk you have to bear. And another one I already mentioned, uh, I actually was more like explaining of what would happen, is called capital controls. The risk that after you invested the money in the stock market, they won't let you take the profit out. I already told you in, in Bulgaria there's been a public outcry 
by people, of course, who don't understand anything about finance, and politicians who also don't understand anything about finance and economics, that Carrefour, the French, and Metro are taking the profits out of Bulgaria and are bleeding the Bulgarian economy dry. So they loved when the money was coming in, but now it's a horrible thing and they want to impose capital controls on the evil French and German who just want to take their profit out. Okay? Well, thanks God that European Union says, no, guys, you can't do that. Not while you're in the European Union. If you want to go out, it's your problem. But while in the EU, you can't do that. But countries like Venezuela would do that. Uh, countries like Bolivia will do that easily. Countries like Russia will do that. Okay, Iran would like to do that. Okay, so these are all some of the risks, and we are up to page 442, 422, the euro currency market. Camera assistance, push stop. Yeah, it's not.